Um, so I'm presenting today on basically kind of a lot of what you've seen, but applied to the day-to-day day -day design process of, of uh, designing one of these buildings. Um, so I am a design technology specialist. That means I kind of swoop into a project when there's a lot of geometric complexity involved, when we need to run a lot of analysis, when you, we need to apply urban scale data to the design of a tower, um, which, is, which is kind of our approach here with, at, at Woods Bagot. So I kind of only see a snapshot of the building process, but I do get to work on the cool stuff, which means a lot of the iconic tall towers. So I would like to use one that I've worked on recently um, over the past year um, as a case study here, which is the Chongqing Tower. Um, there's kind of a funny obsession here, obviously, with how tall a tower is, that exact number. This one is 431 meters, and that's important. But I kind of had to change the way, because I always think about towers in terms of how many levels they have, because as someone who's doing a lot of the building information modeling, I'm, I'm basically counting levels and thinking about how many times I have to duplicate something. Um, so. I've got it now, I'm thinking about heights. So I wanna start a little bit with the, the context um, of an iconic tall tower, because that's really where the story starts and the interaction between the client and the architect starts. Um, so we're on this really interesting area between two rivers in Chongqing in a historic district actually on this peninsula. Um, and what's, what I think is, is fairly unique about um, building a super tall tower on a site like this is you have the historic context. So there's already a lot of inherent value in the city. So I think the story of the Chongqing Tower is actually a story of responsible urban development between local officials and the architect because um, you know, on one hand, you're not really worrying as much about recouping the costs of the high land either by trying to buy up immediate context to program that, to kind of um, be a little bit more efficient in how you're making money, um, or, or worrying about getting priced out of your own neighborhood. You know, that can happen a lot with, with buildings like this. So then if you wanted to buy land in the future, you've actually kind of shot yourself in the foot there. So it was a nice symbiotic relationship because there's this high value historic building stock that's complementing this high rise and really the idea was to just reactivate this, this already kind of high value land and, and, and reactivate it kind of uh, 24 hours throughout the day in different ways through the tower's programming. Um, and the other thing worth mentioning here, although this theory perhaps has been dis disproven as we, uh, we uh, mentioned the rivalry, the intra-city rivalry theory, um, you know, Chongqing is a, is a tier two city. When you, when you work with a developer and you make a signature project like this, you're really kind of giving that team the ability to now go get land and get projects in a tier one city. They have a project like this in their portfolio, they're now going to be a lot more competitive and actually this particular team went on to um, be successful with some business in Hong Kong, so it, it really works. Um, and I was thinking you'd have to imagine that if you're a tier two city, maybe you wanna be a tier one city one day and well, this is, this is the way to start that, but perhaps more research is needed there. Um, and then there's the story, because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to, in order to provide value to the project, you, you have to have a story behind it. It's gotta to connect to the, the local context and the local inhabitants. And then part of that can then start to have this playful relationship between the form, because when we think of an iconic tower, and I think most of what we're seeing out in the exhibition area, I would describe as iconic super talls, is that um, you want this playful relationship between the story and the form of the building, the geometry of the building. Um, so here we had, we had some dualities we had kind of identified with the client. Um, both dualities in the inhabitants of Chongqing as well as dualities in the landscape of Chongqing. It's surrounded by mountains and yet it's on the river. So uh, uh, we actually found that we could relate the building form to some Chinese characters to kind of start to discuss that difference between from one perspective of the tower you have the mountain and from the other perspective you have the water. And this is also important because when you're building a super tall and you're trying to connect that tower to the urban fabric, you're always working at a couple different scales. You, you have the kind of immediate site you're trying to activate at the street level, um, trying to engage uh, public and private, security concerns, things like that. 
but then you're engaging the kind of broader city and you're thinking about not only how can I provide high value views of the city to kind of raise prices for rent in the tower, but also um, how can the tower present itself in a dynamic way to the inhabitants of the city as they kind of move around the city. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the programming strategy here because I think there were some interesting approaches um, to the typical kind of super tall program stack. Um, so on the left you see some kind of block studies of how that stack is going up with an early kind of design scheme, rough massing, and then on the right you see the implementation of the final tower form um, relative to that stack. And what struck me when I kind of first started working on the project was the placement of the hotel at the top. So kind of based on my experience with towers, which I would say is primarily kind of a North American centric um, approach is that the hotel is typically at the bottom. Uh, the office ends up kind of being somewhere in the middle and then you put the residences at the top because in theory the higher you go, whether it's from just kind of uh, this uh, projection of kind of like wealth and power of being at the top of a tower or you really can qualitatively say that the views are better the taller you go, um, that's where the high value is and if you want to get people to pay, you know, that kind of rent then, then you put it at the top. But instead we see the hotel at the top. Um, and the other thing about putting the hotel at the top is typically when you're designing the core of a hotel there's a lot more back of house stuff going on. So the core tends to be a bit, bit bulkier at the top. Um, so that to me seemed a curious approach uh, initially but then it kind of came to make sense later in terms of the activation of the tower program. Um, so these are not the final elevatoring diagrams but they give you, this is kind of a working set, but it gives you an idea of what's going on here in terms of the different types of people that are coming in and activating this tower. So you have the, the office workers coming in, you have the people who live here coming in. It's fairly straightforward. You go to the main lobby and you elevate her up. Um, but then something kind of changes with, with the hotel because in this slide um, we're seeing that the observation deck is on the top but there was actually a change later to make that the hotel lobby. Um, so the idea being that uh, it, it, it kind of becomes a semi, a semi private or semi public space because you have a mix of maybe the community coming in because uh, sometimes there are kind of community activities in hotel lobbies in China. A colleague of mine told me he once saw Santa Claus in a hotel lobby. So the types of things that I would associate being in maybe like a commercial or a mall space in North America could potentially be in a, an Asian lobby here. So. What actually ends up happening is by swapping that observation deck out um, with the hotel lobby is you get this really interesting circulation where you're actually shooting all the way up to the top and then coming back down into the tower. So it's almost this kind of like water fountain effect and you're getting a lot more kind of circulation over the vertical dimension of the tower. And this I think has always been one of the challenges as we kind of build taller and taller and taller is how do we get away from this kind of horizontal striation these kind of uh, well-defined blocks of program um, and how do we live more vertically? How do we actually activate that vertical dimension? Um, and, and how do we start to blur that program? We talk a lot at Woods Baggett about sector blur. Nothing is just one thing anymore. You're never just working on retail. You're never just working on residential. Um, these, these towers are cities within cities so there's a lot going on. So um, I just thought this was a really interesting way to start to rethink vertical circulation and again emphasize that, that vertical um, dimension. Um, what that means is then the tower crown takes on extra importance. That's already a beacon to the city. That's a way you kind of communicate the iconic tower to the surrounding context. It's a, it's a highly visible area. You can see this from very far away. Um, this was an initial study um, that actually did not make it into the final design in part because it didn't it didn't relate to the design geometry um, as much as the rest of the language of the tower. Also in part because the interior lantern while working really well as a beacon to the rest of the city um, actually causes some interior glare issues. Um, so if you're trying to promote this hotel lobby as being a really high value space and a large part of that value being the views that you can get as a local of your own city or as a tourist of the city you're coming to visit and spend your money in. Um, then that might not be the best way to go. So first of all, uh, it was redesigned so that the kind of arc geometry that we're getting in the silhouette of the tower 
was also used at the two ends of the tower. And again, the two ends of the tower, the way we kind of engage with the two scales of the city, obviously at the entry of the tower, that's where you can engage with the immediate context at street level. And then at the top of the tower, that's kind of where you're signaling to the rest of the city. Um, so here you can see that implemented in some renders, um, a really kind of generous entryway to a large plaza at the base of the city, very welcoming um, to all different types of people that are coming in and using the tower. Um, and then you've got the top, and you can see here there's kind of this catenary arch that hangs down, um, and then it's, it's striated, almost, almost like louvers, um, and there's a tilting of the windows, and there are a couple of reasons for that. So I had mentioned the issue of the views outward. So in one sense, um, by putting those ledges in that kind of horizontal striation, you allow a place where you can do exterior lighting. So as opposed to this idea of a lantern that's kind of burning from within, you're now lighting the exterior of the facade. Um, so this still helps signal the tower to the, to the rest of the context. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't, it doesn't cause as much glare. It's easier to see outside through that space. Um, so there are just some kind of test renders here of what that would look like during the day and then what that would start to look like at dusk when that lights up. Um, so then thinking, kind of moving away from the program stack and getting into floor area efficiency, which is the kind of almighty percentage number that you're usually going for, um, we started to look at similar towers. Um, so I've seen clients ask for over 80. I'm not sure if that's possible. Um, and I've seen buildings perform in the high 70s, but what we said was let's take a look at similar projects and particularly similar projects in the region. Um, that will give us a realistic sense and give, give all of the stakeholders a realistic sense of how much sellable area we'll have in these towers. Um, but the issue with iconic form is you're not just extruding something, um, so it becomes a bit difficult to do those calculations. Um, so you have to get creative, and the way we got creative was actually kind of changing that core configuration as it moves up. And this is not unusual. You typically have cores drop off as you circulate vertically. Um, but this started to kind of give us a sense of, of how to govern the form a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about the eight facades and the kind of significance of that relative to the programming in the core. Um, so as that changes up, we're able to then achieve um, some pretty good numbers in terms of that floor area ratio. And there were obviously a ton of studies done with respect to structure, with respect to tenancies and space planning. Um, but this ended up kind of being the creative solution that, again, made a form like this viable in terms of sellable floor area. And here we can see some examples of what that core to kind of perimeter tenancy relationship looks like per program stack with an average efficiency there of kind of 68. Um, and this is also where I'd like to point out the relationship between the space planning and the outside facade. So ultimately, this is a, uh, this is a tower with eight facades. Um, and that started to be justified here as you know, we work with the client to find the right floor areas for the different types of tenancies we have. So you can see here we have eight office units per floor that relate to those eight facades. With the residences, you have um, 16 in this image. Um, and then there was kind of some play back and forth with the, or sorry, with the hotel, you have 16. But with the residences, that tends to be a little bit more of a volatile market in terms of you know, how much floor area you should provide and, and what that does to the costs of those units. Um, so there were some studies, I think, with four and some studies with eight, but this even worked with six. And what you also see here, um, is uh, this core's kind of responsiveness to how public or how private the programming is as well. So it ended up working on a lot of levels. You can see with the residences, you get these kind of semi-private corridors that it's either your own corridor per unit or you're only sharing it with your next door neighbor versus in a hotel or an office space where you're all sharing that same circulation. So here it is just a little bit closer. So that's divided by eight, working very well with the geometry divided by 16, and then here we see those kind of semi-private or private corridors um, where the tenants can kind of have their own space. So this really started to begin the story of the eight facades and the tower geometry, which was you know, developed further and after exhaustive formal studies here. Um, so you start with your typical extrusion. You typically pinch it toward the top because there's, there's less program, there's less core to deal with. 
Um, but then we had to negotiate both the kind of changing programs and, and tenancies in space planning, but also the changing core. So that's where you start to see this pinch happening in the middle, and that's where the four facades become eight. Um, and then the resultant form is one that is not only aesthetically pleasing to everyone, but has this kind of dynamic relationship as you view it from, from different angles. Um, and actually, it's, it's extremely dynamic. I didn't realize how dynamic this form was until we milled a kind of large scale model of it and you kind of move around it in the office exhibition space. Um, it takes on some like really interesting silhouettes. Um, so the way that the geometry ended up being governed from the modeling side, so this is where I usually come in, um, is it was a series of arcs in plan or circles um, that were then swept along a series of arcs in elevation. So you can see uh, extremely large radii. So very, a very slight curvature is all that was needed, which means the center of those circles is like, you know, miles or kilometers off in space. Um, and then here you see the radii that are governing the silhouette. And it's alternating between a concave and a convex facade, which means it's got a concave and a convex silhouette. And then you sweep each of those circles and plan along the circles and elevation and you get um, a really kind of big, like almost like flower looking thing. And then as you peel those layers away, you actually reveal the tower form in the center, which is kind of a cool process. So I came in and we were doing some studies for geometry rationalization because we were starting to work with the facade consultants. And again, one of the challenges here with um, when you have uh, when you have form, challenging form like this is keeping the cost of construction down um, so that it's you know, digestible for everyone involved. So one of the things we looked at was looking at a bunch of donut shapes or tori um, and having those intersect because I was curious if we, swept a, if we swept a circle along another circle like we saw in the pre previous slides, then every floor slab would have the same radius, um, which is efficient on one hand. But I decided that I wanted to kind of look at this, which meant with very tiny angles in the stack joint, um, we would actually have a consistent radius the entire way up. And we just kind of wanted to see the relationship. Honestly, it kind of doesn't matter, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, when you have huge towers, some of these minute differences start to fall under construction tolerances, which again is kind of a high value feature of a skyscraper. Um, so that tiny blue box in the middle is 431 meters high. So these are like the world's largest donuts. They're all intersecting in the middle to create the tower form. Um, there's the intersection happening, so we're kind of familiar, we're getting that flower shape from the zero meters to the 431 meters at the intersection. And then we split all of those donuts against one another and what we're getting with the convex and concave surfaces alternating is actually the kind of interior face and exterior face of those donut shapes. And this gives us our, what I would call our rational form. Um, so this is built from a series of rational primitives. Everything's very nice and orderly. Um, and this kind of sets the foundation for a collaborative digital process. I believe very strongly, and Woods Bagga believes very strongly, in this data-centric, model-centric approach to delivering complex buildings. If you have, basically, if you, if you take care of business at this stage, then everything else is gonna go that much smoother. You know, as we saw in the first presentation, there is a ton of cost uncertainty in a project like this, and one way of minimizing that is by collaborating with things like building information modeling. Um, and then after the form comes the tower panelization. So part of the reason we're rationalizing the form is so we have less variation in the panel. So we can still make this ambitious form but not have a lot of variation which reduces the cost of the manufacturing. Um, and in order to kind of properly anticipate the cost of manufacturing, you have to work very early with your consultants and we were, we were lucky to work with the structural, or rather the um, facade consultants very early on this to get some kind of sense of where we needed to go. Um, so we're doing very well. Obviously the program stack then has an uh, impact on floor to floor, so you're trying to be efficient about that and, and not change your levels too much or have too much variation per kind of programmed section of the tower. And then ultimately you get one of these, di I do these diagrams all day long, which is your kind of typical panel dimensions versus your atypical conditions, and you're trying to maximize the percentage of typical panels to reduce that cost. Um, 
The problem with this type of optimization is that it can tend to overemphasize something like construction cost when really the value, the economic value that this tower is providing is essentially how attractive and how meaningful and how iconic it is to the community. So um, typically there's this kind of bounce back a little bit or spring back where we say, okay, maybe this isn't optimized solution for kind of one design objective, but we've got a lot of stuff going on in a project like this. So we actually bounce back to something that is slightly less efficient for construction, but, but really protects the value of the form. And to some, these might be minute differences, but you see a little bit more tapering there. In the center, there's a higher maximum draft angle. It actually makes for a much more elegant form. Um, so this is what we have here. Again, we're losing a little bit of efficiency, but it's really no big deal in the grand kind of scheme of things. And in fact, just by introducing a gap, and this is where we start to work with the um, facade consultants, we can actually get back to that original efficiency of typical panels. Um, and here, what happens when you set out vertical joints at the base of a tower that's changing from level to level um, is that you start to get a little bit of panel stagger or mullion stagger. Um, so uh, one thing that was really important is the idea of model-driven collaboration. Again, a way to minimize um, the kind of economic unknowns is to work very efficiently in the same models. We're talking about building information modeling, but we're also talking about a soft BIM approach where we're all in Rhino and Grasshopper. And the um, facade consultants, the LDI, and the architects all knew Rhino, they all knew Revit, they all knew Grasshopper. Um, so you had a strong team that could all work in the same language. Um, if not the same like actual spoken language, the same digital language. Um, and this was an interesting lesson because it's the typical like, I think like an architect, engineers think a little bit different. So I kind of slice this precious building form up and there are thousands of minute differences in dimensions and the engineer comes back and says, actually we can provide the same exact solution just by making a kit of parts. You know, we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 different panel sizes. Some are rectangles, some are skewed, but then we have an incremental approach where I basically have, you know, 12 different Legos, and I know that if I stack them in a certain way, we can describe that form. So you learn a lot too by collaborating early and in the same models with your consultants. Um, and is, you know, super talls have super tolerances. Again, like a huge, a huge, I think, like undervalued benefit of working on such large scales is that you can do really dynamic design gestures and really not have a lot of variation when we get down to the nuts and bolts of a panel to panel kind of distance. So this is a study by the facade consultants just saying that, yep, yeah, we can do a lot of cold bending here. No problem. There was, there was really not a lot of pushback from the, from the consultants, um, despite our initial concerns about the form. Um, so I've talked a lot about applying a computational approach to facade rationalization, but the cost of a facade construction is just one minor kind of part of the story of kind of having a holistic economic approach to this stuff. So um, we are constantly developing an approach where we can um, collect urban data um, and work with developers even before a project starts because maybe the question isn't, you know, how are we going to make this project, but where's the best place to build this project and when? And to be able to respond to design changes. These projects take years to complete. A lot of stuff changes um, both in terms of the design but also perhaps more importantly in terms of the economic environment. Um, you know, maybe square footage of tenancies has to change. Um, maybe the local economic situation is, is changing. And we can kind of get the analytics that we need to respond to the client much faster. So I think a big part of the economics of iconic tower design is working in a data-driven, model-driven approach. Um, so we're, we're currently working on all sorts of solutions to this. Um, we're building custom Rhino and Grasshopper tools. We can get the local climate, we can get the local transit situation. Um, what's been really cool in terms of working with developers is moving into VR, so you can start to see what impact does it have if I push and pull. And then the developers can actually become the designers and they, they think it's a video game and they have a lot of fun. And they start scheduling all their meetings at our office just so they can play with the VR stuff, um, which is good for us in terms of business development. 
Um, and then the last thing I wanted to end on is the economy of tall tower model making. We actually found that when you start to make massing models of this scale, the, the cheapest way to do it is robotic milling. I would have never thought that robotic milling was the most cost effective way to do these models. But as we do more and more of these tall towers, um, it actually turns out that that's cheaper than both 3D printing and traditional CNC machining in terms of both the scale and the form of those towers. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.